Right now, though, we have the pleasure uh, to listen to Neil Lawrence. Uh, Neil is Senior Turing AI Fellow at the Ellen Turing Institute and DeepMind Professor of Machine Learning at Cambridge in the Department of Computer Science and Technology. He's worked on machine learning models at Cambridge, Sheffield, and Manchester, and recently spent uh, three years as Director of Machine Learning at Amazon before returning back to Cambridge. He also co-hosts the Talking Machines uh, podcast series alongside Kefren Gorman. Uh, he's also a member of the Royal Society's uh, DELF Working Group, which is essentially a group that supports a data-driven approach to learning from the different approaches that countries are taking to manage the pandemic. And at DELF, uh, Neil co-convened the DELF Action Team together with UIT. So today, uh, Neil will talk about policy, science, and the convening power of data. He'll talk for about um, 30 minutes or so, followed by 15 minutes Q&A. And um, for the audience, uh, just remember, if you would like to ask questions and engage, uh, please put them in the uh, Q&A Q &A box and then upvote them so we can pick them up in the Q&A session later. Neil, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Inken. Um, thanks very much for the introduction and thanks very much to the organizers uh, to, to the invite for this uh, extraordinary event. Um, so, uh, as Inkin says, I'm here, I'm a machine learning uh, researcher, but I've done very little machine learning in the pandemic, I think for reasons that I'll reveal today. And I've tended to be using more my skill set uh, around, um, uh, I suppose, management uh, of operational science in the pandemic. And uh, what I want to talk about today is this notion of the interface between, just coming up at the end of that panel, between policy science and the convening power of data. So uh, the Delve group today released its um, report on data readiness, um, lessons from an emergency, uh, which you can certainly find on the Twitter feed. Um, and uh, the story, of course, isn't a really very rosy one in terms of the availability of data. So the Delve group um, that uh, I was a member of was, uh, I was first contacted in 3rd of April and the sort of remit was to pull together a data science team um, in order to, as Incan suggested, answer policy questions around uh, international comparisons, particularly with a view to how to leave lockdown. Um, we had our first meeting of the steering committee on 7th of April, and we'd sort of pulled together a team of various people on the 16th of April. Um, and always at the beginning of this, the idea was that data was at the heart. We were going to use data to answer policy questions. Um, but I was very aware as soon as I was contacted that there were gonna be massive challenges around getting data. Most projects I've been involved with just sit there on their hands waiting for data. So in an effort to uh, not become subject to that type of challenge uh, in Delve, we, we made sure that uh, we weren't reliant on uh, particular data sets to draw our conclusions, but we tried to use data where it's available. Now, as Part of that's the sort of in, in background to today's talk, but I just want to sort of go to a little bit of formal background of what I see the big challenges in this space are. And they're probably not the challenges that uh, you typically expect a scientist to talk about, but uh, I'm going to try and motivate them with a little bit of science. So the challenge that I see is to do with what I call uh, embodiment factors. So everything to me is a communication challenge. And this gentleman uh, in the big picture here is Claude Shannon. Um, and he's famous for doing the discrete version of information theory. Uh, Norbert Wiener did a lot of work on the continuous information. Um, but uh, one of the things Shannon also did is estimate the amount of information in the human language. And he roughly estimated that if you're speaking in a regular voice, a human can communicate with another human at about 100 bits per second. So that's roughly what I'm doing now. So a bit, I probably shouldn't need to explain too much at the Turing Institute, but a bit is equivalent to the amount of information in the result of a coin toss. Now, in comparison to this, our computers can communicate with this enormous one gigabit per second. I mean, that's why we're all able to join by video. I mean, it's we're very lucky that's going on. I mean, that's computer to computer. Perhaps we're not all on gigabit connections, but that's the sort of order of communication that a computer um, can achieve. Now, when we look at our intelligence, the thing that uh, we spend all our time trying to replicate in some form, the best estimates I could find estimate that to simulate, say, the human brain, so that's not the same as 
simulating our intelligence, but to simulate the human brain, it would require around 16 petaflops. Now that is a lot of compute. Um, it's about the same compute as the Met Office's supercomputer has uh, down in Exeter, um, which was when it was bought, it was like the 11th fastest in the world. I'm sure it must have slipped down the list by now. But it, it spends its mornings uh, computing our weather and its afternoons computing our climate. It's an extraordinary machine. Um, so we have much more computation than a computer, but much less ability to communicate. And I first started talking about this when I was trying to explain to people why AI is not like human intelligence. What it leaves us with is this ratio that I call the embodiment factor, the ratio of our ability to compute to our ability to communicate. Um, so simply put, if I were to try and describe to you one second's worth of the neuron firings that have gone off across in my brain, it would take me about 15 billion years to tell you every neuron firing that's occurred in my head. Whereas if a computer was to try and tell another computer all the computations it had done within one second, it would only take it about 20 minutes. So our intelligence is heavily embodied. And you might think, what on earth has that got to do with this pandemic? It's at the core of everything that I've thought about how we go about our business as scientists, because it comes down to this, that most of the things we're trying to do are really about human communication. And there's this wonderful book by Fritz Heider on human communication that Nick Chater, the cognitive scientist from Warwick introduced me to in a meeting a long time ago and made a massive impression on me. And what Fritz Heider says, in order to overcome this very, very narrow bandwidth of communication between two humans, what we actually do is we build a model of the human we're communicating with. And we have a sense of what we might be able to say to that human. They have a model of us and potentially they have a model of what they think we think of them inside their head. And once they hear what we say, they know about that and they make a response designed to clarify what's going on. Conversations between two humans must be proceeding in this way because we have such low bandwidth to communicate. There's no way we could communicate the richness of the world that we're interested in directly by talking to each other. We must be representing each other somehow within our head. Now, when it goes well, it's fine if the conversation is between two peers who understand each other well, even if they're trying to communicate quite a difficult concept, it's like a magical dance where somehow, despite this limited bandwidth, we allow each other to communicate the concept to each other. When it goes badly, it goes very wrong. If there's a slight mismatch between what we're trying to say, if there's a slight mismatch between the language we're using, then we can be in a situation where we just end up swearing at each other. This is particularly challenging when you're putting together people from different domains who have different levels of expertise, who don't even know each other, who are being asked to make judgments about extremely important decisions on a very short notice. Okay, so what's all that got to do with machine learning? So to me, machine learning and artificial intelligence, so most of what we're calling AI at the moment is just machine learning, is just the combination of data and models. And if you're a statistician, you would say, well, but this is also true for statistics. And I would broadly agree. Most of what we're doing, if you're a theoretical epidemiologist, you might also say the same thing is true. You're combining your model with your data about the disease to make a prediction about the future flow of the disease. Indeed, most sciences can be seen as some form of this. It's not really an equation. It's a formula uh, where we're combining data about the world with our model of how the world works, our best understanding of physics to make predictions. And we're doing so through compute. The difference is the emphasis each of us places on the different parts of this equation. So a theoretical epidemiologist places a lot more emphasis on the model. Um, a statistician will tend to place an emphasis on interpretation rather than quality of prediction, so an understandable model. And a machine learner tends to not worry about the complexity of their model or the interpretability of their model, um, but they focus a lot on combining it with large data and big compute. I'm generalizing, of course. Data can operate as a convener. 
as we were just hearing, as Neil Ferguson was saying, the importance of multidisciplinary views, the challenges he mentioned around maybe we had too large and unwieldy systems for making uh, predictions about the pandemic. How do we assimilate multiple views from multiple different places, the doctors on the front line, the theoretical epidemiologists, the statisticians rapidly in the same place? Well, you've got that communication barrier. But what I would argue is that data is the solution. So data operates as a convener because it allows for externalization of cognition. So uh, Fritz Heider talks about this and his books from like the 1950s. He said, you have, you have to be able to represent the subject within the head of each of the people that's speaking about it in the correct way in order to allow conversation to happen. Now, I'm a model, I'm a machine learning. I'm fascinated by building Gaussian process models and doing all that sort of stuff. But I've spent a lot of time trying to deploy those things in the real world. And the thing that I've started to realize is much as I love my model, much as I love playing with mathematics, um, the model is highly dangerous because it can lead to what I call model induced blindness. So this is just a variation on Kahneman's idea of theory induced blindness. If I become obsessed with my mathematical model, I can see nothing that, that can happen uh, outside the bounds of my mathematical model. This is particularly dangerous because maths is complex and difficult for other people to understand. So if you've got different people with different levels of understanding, different models, it's very difficult for them to converse about the same externalized entity in order to ensure a smooth transfer of ideas. My argument, my first argument, and certainly I'm not proving this, and so you know we'll um, need to invoke some of uh, David Spiegelhalter's understanding of how to express uncertainty. I'm not saying that the following is true, but this is my gut instinct, that data is a lot easier. It's a lot easier to talk about the type of data you might want, why you might want it, what sort of questions you want to ask, and it brings modelers and public health experts and economists and social scientists all together around the same table and allows them to have a conversation that is multidisciplinary. Okay, so that's the first sort of formal introduction to the sort of theory of what we try to do when pulling Delve together, because right at the heart of what we wanted to do was bring together a multidisciplinary group. And indeed, all those types of people were represented. We had economists, social scientists, we had behavioral economists as well as um, uh, macroeconomists, microeconomists. We had scientists of different flavors. We had epidemiological modelers. We had machine learners. We had statisticians. Um, and the key is to try and extract the most amount of information out of these people as rapidly as possible. In fact, the key is to do what I refer to as the supply chain of ideas. So what is the supply chain of ideas? Well, we need to ask Narayan. Narayan was my colleague at Amazon. He was a senior scientist in the supply chain and spent a career in the supply chain. And one day he said to me, well, Neil, let me tell you what the supply about a supply chain that's in Kerala. Now in this supply chain in Kerala, there's a man and he sells coconuts. And every time a boat comes by, he climbs up the coconut palm, selects a coconut and brings it down and sells it to the tourist. Then Narayan, who had a sort of wonderful deep voice and a booming laugh would say, this man has the shortest supply chain in the world. When he'd stop laughing about this, he would say, the magic of supply chain is to make people think that that is true for everything not just the coconuts that the man is selling. So behind the magic of supply chain are a number of things. You have to understand what the demand for product is. You have to understand what the availability of supply is. You have to understand what your current stock is. You have to understand in real supply chain, not so much the supply chain of ideas, although I guess it does creep in, cost basis and purchase orders. In a pandemic, the biggest thing that I could see as a challenge, the biggest bottleneck was mapping the demand for ideas to the supply of ideas. And these bottlenecks are being caused by these difficulties of communication. And one of the things I found immensely frustrating about many of my scientific colleagues was the extent to which they thought just by shouting about their scientific idea, that was going to get their scientific idea deployed in the right place. Everyone's under stress. And a lot of what needs to be going on is 
I should say, not my scientific colleagues in Dell, just in general, um, a lot of what needs to be going on is working out where you can be most effective, where those ideas are needed and facilitating the passage of those ideas to the right place. Okay, so that's the notion of the supply chain of ideas, which Narayan came up with, and we were busy trying to impose uh, within, ironically, the Amazon supply chain, um, because what we were trying to do was impose scientific ideas within the Amazon supply chain. Amazon supply chain is amazingly well organized, but we were sort of saying, well, how do we bring new, big new ideas? And we use analogies such like some of these ideas have a very long lead time, some of them have short lead times. Um, and that was quite successful. So Narayan's the origin of this idea. But after Ryan told me this, I thought about myself and I decided, well, basically I'm a coconut scientist. What do I mean by that? I mean, every time comes up, someone comes up to me and says, I need an idea, I give them a coconut idea. It happens to be the idea that's hanging at the top of my tree, the idea that I'm most expert in. But the probability that that's the right idea for solving any particular problem is pretty small. Okay, so why did, how do we try and solve that within Delve? Well, Delve was a Royal Society convened project and apologies for my handwriting here. This is just the sketch I used to onboard people when they joined Delve in terms of what our structure was. Royal Society convened projects often have a structure that looks like this. There's a steering committee that's often composed of the great and good. Um, there's a working group, which is also composed of the great and good, but they're, I suppose, intended to be more active on the study than uh, typically the steering committee might be, so more directly involved. Um, and the bottom bit is new innovation because the challenge for us in terms of uh, operating this structure is this is a structure that's designed to work um, as evidence pans out over multiple years, whereas we were trying to work in a situation where evidence was panning out in a matter of multiples, uh, a few days. Um, in fact, our first report, I think, was compiled and delivered within 10 days of our first convening. So the action team is the new component. That's at the bottom. And that's what it says in my slightly dodgy writing. The action team was a new component um, which we designed uh, with UIT um, in order to have a group of people that was actually closely connected intellectually to the working group and the steering committee. I'm gonna come back to that, but was actually going to be delivering and dedicating a very large amount of their time to doing the day-to-day -day work. So actually, the action team was people from all levels. We had full professors all the way down to PhD students. It was all about their utility and their ability to deliver on a particular question. So the notion of the supply chain of ideas in this case is that the real problem is that there were policy questions that the government might have and those we've got on the left. And uh, there's uh, ideas which are within the scientific community and the real bottleneck is the resource we have to map those ideas onto those policy questions. And I view almost the entirety of our work. We definitely filled in scientific gaps where it was necessary. Um, the team built um, uh, simulations, but uh, we had a principle that basically said, we do not redo work. If there's work is already there, we use what's available. So the supply is on the right, the demand is on the left, and we were managing this supply chain. Now, sort of a little bit of comment on, I think, um, you know, it, it's very easy to point fingers at governments and all sorts of things for what they're doing wrong. I think as scientists, it behoves us to look at our own behavior and constantly think about what we could have done better. Um, and uh, with my colleague, uh, Jess, who was also um, heavily involved in Dell, uh, we wrote a short blog post on this, which, uh, because <laughs> watching Monty Python and the Holy Grail, there's a scene where John Cleese in the guise of uh, Sir Lancelot the Brave receives a, an arrow with a message. And it's from a, an individual in distress locked in a tower who's being forced to marry against their will. Lancelot sets off, attacks Swamp Castle single-handedly. Uh, heads up the stairs through all the bridal party slaying people left and right to arrive in the tall tower to find not what he was expecting, a damsel in distress, but Prince Herbert, the son of the king who didn't want to get married. Now, Lancelot's relatively surprised about this um, and uh, immediately tries to uh, uh, make up with the king um, uh, who actually seems to get along quite well with Lancelot. But this heavily reminded me of some of our scientific behaviors where as scientists, we're like Sir Lancelot. We think we know what the question is. We have tremendous skills and bravery to single-handedly attack the problem, but we don't stop and wonder, why was there a bride dancing in the main hall as I sliced open this guard and made my way up the stairs? Isn't that a bit odd, considering I think I'm here to save the bride? 
And I think that that's a challenge that we face because we overly focus on our own domains. We require a multidisciplinary response, and that involves stopping, consulting with colleagues, understanding what the lay of the land is and what the actual question is before diving in. So we view ourselves as the wise Merlin, but the reality is quite different. Now, in my own experience, I spent quite a lot of time actually while I was at Amazon reading these sort of books about how you manage meetings and things like this. And I got to know Matthew Syed sort of before reading this. So having conversations with him about it. And I think there's two particular things in these books that always stick in my head. Um, the first black box thinking is about surfacing of errors. It's about how the medical profession could do well to learn from the um, the uh, aerospace profession in terms of how you surface errors, how you surface when things are going wrong. That's incredibly important. The second is perhaps more important for what we're talking about. It's called Rebel Ideas, and it's all about cognitive diversity. And the key point is that if you are in a situation where there is an enormous amount of uncertainty, it is unlikely that one individual has the solution to all the challenges we face. What you need is as many people as possible to be involved in the decision-making. And that comes back to the supply chain of ideas, obviously. A thought that kept also occurring into my head is it's about science, not scientists. If you keep seeing what scientists say, they're all at odds with each other, but scientists are not science. And I think a good mental model of this is the following. This is a predict picture of Robbie Fowler, uh, Robbie Fowler, Robbie Savage. Uh, Robbie Savage, who's an ex-Wales football international, and he has a podcast and Radio 5 live show. And he sometimes talks about the fact that his son plays football, plays for Manchester United. He also manages a grassroots football team, something that he's very passionate about. And it was while watching my son play grassroots football that an analogy struck me that I thought is, uh, very apt for this situation. Um, when parents are watching their children play football, they are not objective about how their children are playing. They have a personal interest in the game. And I think when you're hearing scientists talk about their science, you have to assume that the same thing is going on. Just as some parents are better at this than others, um, some scientists tend to play down their ideas and some scientists tend to play up their ideas. But the truth is it's subjective. Um, the process of scientific consensus is not what those parents say about what's going on. The game has to play out. In this scenario, I often think the statistician actually somewhat plays the role of the referee because statisticians are sort of trained not to have ideas. They're trained just to look at the data and say, what does the data say? So you do have people like statisticians who are extremely good at being objective about these things. And another group I think is the public health specialists. And I was thinking about how they map into this analogy. I think it's basically because they're keeping score. The public health people see the end result of all the goals that go in. And it doesn't matter what people say about their pet scientific idea. The score is the score. So they tend to be very objective as well. Reminds me of this uh, expression, which is a Neapolitan expression. Ogni scarafone è bella a mamma sola. I think that's my rough attempt at Neapolitan accent, which is a particular Italian accent. And ogni scarafone, I should say, not scarafone. Ogni scarafone è bella mamma sola. And what it means is, it's quite hard to say because scarafon is a particular Neapolitan word that means a sort of ugly thing. And what it's saying is every sort of ugly thing, I mean, literally it means cockroach, but that isn't the interpretation here. It's a sort of really ugly thing, is beautiful to its mother's eyes. Just because scientists say something is good, it doesn't mean science says. And we really need to get on top of saying that as a community, particularly in the presence of uncertainty. Okay, so what did Delve do? Well, we had this network of people from different areas. We had steering groups, we had working groups, and what we tended to try and use is we tried to use, or certainly what I was pushing was these ideas of external cognition around the software tools we were using, the data we were using, regular meetings, and a set of tenets that kept us open in our conversations and kept us asking each other stupid questions. So what were our tenants? Well, we had six of these, which everyone on board was. And these are the following ideas that we used in order to push our multidisciplinary work. So first of all, the primary one, we are steered by policy need, not by scientific curiosity. It was all about what is the policy question that we think needs answering 
most immediately? Where can we be most useful? Another one, which I think policy people are amazing at and scientists a lot less good at. It is amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. So amongst our tenets, uh, I can't remember who that's a quote from, but we're here to be useful as a possible, as, as, as useful as possible, as fast as possible as a group. So if you look at Delve reports, they do not have author names on them. The work is multidisciplinary. Everyone should ask questions and expect to answer to people from other disciplines in ways they can understand and scrutinize. We would summarize this as ask stupid questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Ask anything you want. And how important that was so many times when people asked something that they thought was stupid but happened to be Christian. Don't reinvent the wheel. Always use existing analysis techniques, tools, data sets to answer questions. Being useful is more important than presenteeism. Many of our Dell members had family commitments. They mapped in and out. We never talked about someone having to show up for a certain amount of time. And we all made it clear we had personal commitments. We just worked when we could. And then finally, we should steer a pass between the hedgehog, too attached to a particular, a particular model, and the fox, always considering the worst sort of case outcome. That was a sort of nod to some of the things that were going on on Twitter in the early days of the pandemic. OK, um, so I want to move past the next session because I, don't, I want to make sure we've got enough time for questions. And there's some minor things in there, but they're also in the notes. I provided notes that says everything we did in a nice structured order. I wasn't quite sure how long it would take to get through that. So what was the result? Well, there's been seven Delve reports so far and um, an enormous amount of work directly with uh, government, with civil servants, with uh, groups such as Public Health England, discussions with other bodies trying to help. But the sort of, I guess, the visible outcome is uh, these reports. The face mask report is dated 4th of May, but it went to SAGE a lot earlier, within about 10 days of our first convening. Um, a report on test trace isolate where we um, worked with public health experts and modelers to try and simulate the, what we thought were the uh, particular issues around test trace isolate and give advice to government on what should be put in place. Nosocomial infections, that's within hospital infections, hospital infections acquired within a hospital. The schools report, um, the schools report, I, I mean, a lot of these reports, I believe it's very hard to tell, but the schools report in particular, we heard very senior people in government effectively quoting from our report very shortly after it came out, saying that uh, schools should be the last things to close. Um, economics, which was very much about uh, not the argument, we had economists within our group, we did not have arguments between economists and epidemiologists, we um, were of the opinion that uh, you're trying to optimize for the same thing, and there are downstream consequences um, for people uh, economically um, from health outcomes and everything else, just as well as there are present health outcomes for health, and we try to balance those health outcomes against each other. Of course, there's long-term and short-term uncertainties. The vaccines report, which has turned out to be very prescient, it was before the recent vaccines information, but it outlines various scenarios um, that we may need to follow uh, in the presence of vaccines. And just out today, our data readiness report. So I'm going to spend my last sort of couple of minutes just mentioning um, uh, about the Delve data report. So a lot's been going on with data and we've heard a lot about it. And the first thing I want to clear, uh, clarify is where our area of focus was. I think that many of us would agree that we would have liked more surveillance data early on. We would have liked to see that prioritized. But by the same token, there's been some tremendous strides and advances in um, surveillance data. And I'm just mentioning a few here, um, the ones that came to mind, the REACT study, the ONS coronavirus infection survey, and of course, the which I was just being mentioned in the last section, the sort of recovery trial, which um, was what the randomized trial that was very quickly and rapidly early deployed and let us uh, find out about dexamethasone, one of the early successes in, um, in the fight. Um, but our report is not focused on, on surveillance data. It's focused on something that we're calling happenstance data. What do we mean by happenstance data? Well, classical data in a statistical sense is normally gathered by a statistical design, like a randomized controlled trial, um, with a particular question in mind. So the data is gained with, is gathered with a question in mind. By happenstance data, we're referring to the sort of new data modalities that um, just exist in the process of normal human life. Things like payments card data or things like mobile phone mobility data. These things are quite a different character because they, they are just existing. They, they weren't collected with a 
well, they may have been collected with a question in mind, but it's not the question that we want them to answer. And, and that was our report's focus. So we're trying to use this terminology to differentiate between those two types of data because we think they're of quite a different nature. Okay, so the conclusions of the Dell data report, which is uh, sort of an outcome of um, lots of people thinking about these challenges and trying to get hold of data and answer these policy questions um, are the sort of uh, following. These are the recommendations, the headline recommendations that uh, we came up with. You can read the report, it's online today. So we were incredibly impressed with the ONS and their ability to um, uh, pull together data sets quickly. They were extremely stretched, but wonderfully helpful and extremely knowledgeable about their data sets. Um, we also noticed that when companies who very often held the data that was of interest to us wanted to share their data, as they often did in the public good, they would go to the ONS as a trusted body in order to work with them on that data. And so uh, headline recommendation is the ONS uh, actually has a statutory objective to um, collect survey data and, and report certain statistics to the government uh, on a regular basis. And we think that, that we should be looking at that objective, um, expanding their remit to cover some of this happenstance data. Um, think about what that means. Another major barrier was the need every time you wanted to look at a data set to pass through the very necessary ethical training that you require to look at these data sets. Um, but it would be really good if we could standardize some of that. So we're also recommending the ONS and the ICO collaborate on what we're terming a data driving license to standardize access processes. Now, obviously this could be just the process that the ONS chooses to use for their data sets, but you could imagine other bodies might want to adapt it. And then we could get something standardized in terms of qualifications of people to look at these data sets, which is very important. Um, and third, and very importantly, we're suggesting that the government launches what we're calling Pathfinder projects. And these would be interdisciplinary data-based projects, um, but they would need to operate across government departments businesses and academia. And importantly, they should have very specific outcomes. So an example of one Pathfinder project we think would be very important is what we would call now casting of economic metrics. So um, we should be building capabilities where we're capable of seeing what the immediate effect is of various interventions, um, non-pharmaceutical interventions, for example, on the economy. And we have that capability through looking at payments data, but rushing this stuff together in a pandemic is very hard. This needs to be done as a matter of course. It needs to be peacetime work. And of course, it could be incredibly useful in peacetime. Similar challenges around um, population data. And just to highlight, um, it's not that this is impossible because other countries have managed to make major progress with these data types. So I just want to end by making sure I list the extraordinary members of uh, the action team, uh, the working group and uh, the steering committee. I just like the credits at an end of a film, isn't it? And, um, and, and most importantly, perhaps the Dell Secretariat, the people who are often policy experts themselves who are having to pull of this whole thing together and just say that what I presented to you is the idea that the true thing we're facing is not the lack of ideas, it's the bandwidth constraints of humans in terms of assimilating and implementing these ideas um, and getting those conversations going. I've pushed the idea of data as a convener even when it doesn't exist and we have serious troubles with bringing our data together, particularly this happenstance data. I've mentioned the notion of the supply chain of ideas for how we went about that in Delve and I've sort of outlined what the recommendations are from the uh, today's published Delve report on data. And uh, I'll stop there and ask for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. That was, uh, that was really great and really a uh, colorful talk uh, pulling in all of these other uh, examples that you were talking through. I think you have some really, um, or two, I guess, very powerful propositions, right? One of them, uh, data uh, and the convening power of data to kind of bridge these communication and interdisciplinary challenges. And then the second one, uh, the idea of the supply chain, which I think is, is also a clever way to think about essentially how to bridge policy and academia, right? How do we make sure that the solutions that are being developed actually have, you know, real world problems are connecting to these real world problems and getting to the right getting to the right sources. Um, so thank you for, uh, for flagging these ideas for us and also to um, bring us the hot off the press um, uh, Delve report on, on data readiness. Uh, I know we went like 
a couple of minutes over, but I think it was really good to hear uh, what is in there and what some of these recommendations are. Um, a couple of questions for you. One um, to maybe branch out and uh, broaden a little bit beyond that. And then one question uh, from the audience also on this um, translation between uh, policy and um, academia. So the the broader question is this, like in, in this trying to bridge policy and, and, and science, uh, obviously Delft uh, seems to be a great institutional solution to try to do that. Um, what other ways, you know, for those people outside of Delft or in other fields or potentially, you know, in, in, in different areas of the country or in other countries, what other um, potential do you see to find this bridge, this communication bridge between uh, science and uh, policy makers? Are there other ways that you have encountered? And, you know, not waiting, not waiting for the pathfinder that the UK government might institute as you recommended. And then the second question um, from one of our audience members, which uh, is essentially about uh, behavioral challenges. So um, where does the behavioral aspect of adopting new ideas into practice, that's the buy-in and the change management, fit within the idea of supply chain? And that's a question of uh, Nova Syed. Um, two great questions. Um, let me address the first question um, first. So um, the, I think to me, there's a danger in academia that we just uh, agree amongst ourselves what the important questions are. And there's an enormous amount of credit given to those fields who manage to make their work um, prestigious within that self-selecting environment. The leading journals are not necessarily pu are publishing the most useful stuff. Um, it's often the stuff that's easiest to see that it's difficult or easiest to proclaim. And I find that very sad because we it dis, it actually negatively affects the career path of young researchers who are interested in addressing real world problems. So I think if we can, I mean, my own approach is to try and constantly look at where your stuff is done in the real world. And this forces you to talk across disciplines. This forces you to bring brothers. So if you can coalesce around actionable questions, of course, it's very hard to find the right ones. I, I did most of my learning, and I suspect there's people from the audience who were also in this position, in the field of computational biology, where a lot of us in the data side were suddenly thrown together with biologists who didn't necessarily understand our models and were forced to basically um, think about what we were doing in a different way. That would lead into, I think, the other question, which is, um, I think we have to be very careful about assuming the onus is on the recipient of the idea, our holy idea that we bring like a grail uh, to them to uh, sort of assimilate this in, in a way, you know, oh, 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 thank you, great Sir Lancelot for your wonderful idea, you know, how can we ever, you know, it's not like that. The people who were trying to make the decisions are extremely busy. They're under an immense amount of pressure and they're having to understand the complexities of an evolving situation very, diff uh, very quickly. So the onus is on, on the, the, the supply chain of ideas itself um, to present those ideas in such a way that is digestible um, for the policy makers as well as the policy makers to try and listen to scientists. I mean, it goes both ways, right? And I think that that implies that we need to do more in inverted commas, peacetime work in this space, that this needs to be something that is part and parcel of academic careers, that you spend time engaging in these type of processes. And of course, the beauty is, if we do that, then I would hope that we would be talking about um, a government policy making that was necessarily therefore more data driven. Otherwise, it wouldn't have space for all of these people with their ideas about how you should do things. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and then maybe uh, since we have just like three or four uh, more minutes, let us return to this um, basic idea of data, right? And data as, as the, the convening power and the potential uh, solution. So um, some of our earlier speakers uh, also know that, that even if you have data, right, the challenge that often arises is in sort of communicating the data and visualizing the data and making sure it's not either misunderstood or misconstrued in some ways. Um, so understanding the data and transferring it and communicating is often quite a challenge to politicians and people in power as well as to the general public. This has been sort of 
uh, red line, red thread uh, throughout the day. Do you have any thoughts on that for how to better do that? Is Delve at the, at the forefront of you know, trying to make these reports uh, sort of in a very <laughs> easy to digestible uh, language for the public uh, in that way? And secondly, also related to the, to the data question is uh, one question from our audience uh, by Shin Du, who says, um, regarding the bottleneck caused by the data resources uh, that you mentioned earlier, uh, what is your attitude to transfer learning? So perhaps we can uh, conclude with so, this. Um, I guess I'll take the, the, the second question first. So, um, uh, I, sorry, I, I, I probably misled. The bottleneck I'm saying is not the data resources, it's, it's based on people's information bandwidth. So, um, it's uh, trying to get the messages to the right people of the ideas and the, the questions to the people who have the ideas is, is where I was saying the bottleneck is. Certainly we did then face challenges on the data resources. Sorry, could you mention the, fir the first part of the question uh, again? I was just you, trying you to should always answer the first part first so you don't get in this trouble, go ahead. I yeah. was just trying My to information push really bandwidth. Yeah, I was trying to push really hard and see if like the silver bullet for us oh, since yeah. you are one of our last. I, I think, you know, I constantly keep looking at it and thinking, let's get our house in order. I mean, scientists are really bad at data. You know, we point the finger at everyone else, but I see the most shocking things around scientists and what they think about their data, how they understand data, how they'll misrepresent data. Um, and how they are not capable of collecting data sets um, for themselves always. Okay, so I'm generalizing. Of course, there's some who are amazing at it. But, um, you know, one of the things we're doing in Cambridge is we've got this Accelerate program for um, scientific discovery, which is about driving forward science discovery through machine learning and artificial intelligence. But one of the first things we've done is convene a program around basic data skills for very clever, technically capable people who would love to learn about fancy machine learning algorithms such as transfer learning. But the thing that I tend to spot is problematic is not that stuff. It's what I tend to think of as a sense of data. And statisticians really, really have this, that they spend a lot of time developing it because they work on practical problems. And, but it's remarkably missing, even in a number of groups that supposedly work on data. And it's actually not taught. The first person to bring this notion up to me was a guy called Terry Speed. Um, and I sort of wondered what he was talking about, but as I got closer and closer to real world problems, I really got a sense of what he's saying. This notion of a sense of data really requires you to work on real world problems with actionable answers, um, which are going to have an effect. And that, there's nothing like that to hone your refereeing sense that the statisticians have. 